My name is Elizabeth Stevens, and I'm a pediatric and congenital cardiac surgeon here at Mayo Clinic. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Emily Bendel, an interventional radiologist who specializes in lymphatic issues. And today, we'll be talking about lymphatic issues, including in our cardiac surgery and congenital heart surgery patients. I commonly think of chylus effusions in our patients, but as I've learned more, it's more than just simple chylus effusions. Can you tell us more? Absolutely. So typically we do see chylus effusions most of the time in congenital heart patients. However, we can see chyle leaks or chyle accumulation anywhere. We can see it in the gut or protein losing enteropathy. We can see it in the airways from plastic bronchitis, uh, especially with pulmonary lymphatic perfusion syndrome. If you look at this slide here, you can see that uh, the flow of the contrast goes back towards the lungs. And with this condition, you can actually see either a chylus effusion or plastic bronchitis. So in this child, we ended up finding a chylus effusion. But in this one, on this other slide, we actually have plastic bronchitis where it accumulates in the airway and then they cough it out. So those are just two examples of where lymph can accumulate in places maybe you're not thinking of. Uh, but we also see them in lymphatic malformations, and we see them with either a you know, direct leak after a surgery, but also just in flow-related issues, such as a backup due to maybe a blockage somewhere. Wow, there's so many things other than chylus effusions. But let's just come back to chylus effusions for, for a minute. Many of our families and physicians will be familiar with maybe being stuck in the hospital after surgery with chest tubes and people are changing their diet, maybe even um, making nothing by mouth, trying medications. They'll mention maybe surgical duct ligation um, or pleurodesis as some of the ways. But we're seeing that there are more and more novel ways to potentially deal with these, um, these issues. Um, maybe can you go through some of the workup and the diagnostics that occur for these patients? Sure. Um, one of the things that I think about originally is, is it actually Kyle? So, of course, once we've decided that it's a lymphatic accumulation of fluid after testing that fluid and proving that it's Kyle, then usually the next most common step is to get an MR lymphangiogram. This is a test that has really not been along a, as you know, long as we are familiar with some of the other treatments that we have, uh, it, what it can do is show us the map of the anatomy of the lymphatics and also what is going on, what the problem is. Uh, it's really nice that we have that. And here at Mayo, we actually have one of the combination MRI scanners where we have ultrasound in the procedure suite. And so we can place needles into small lymph nodes in the MRI suite and then do the imaging of the lymphatic system using water-soluble contrast to show us what's going on. And that's usually our first step to kind of diagnose what's going on. As you can see here, we have other tests available to us. So we have MR lymphangiography, we have CT lymphangiography, and then standard lymphangiography, all allowing us to evaluate the lymphatic system. Uh, with that, you know, we pair it with other interventions, such as conservative measures like you're describing. But that MR lymphangiogram is pretty critical in these patients. Uh, you can see here, this child is undergoing an MR lymphangiogram, and they have the needles in the nodes and are nicely asleep while we figure out what's going on with the lymphatic system and create a future plan for intervention. That's been quite the advance, and I, I've seen, you know, this requires so many people with all sorts of expertise all coming together. It's not, um, it's understandable why only very few centers have been able to offer these types of techniques. Um, so once we do have a diagnosis, can you kind of go through some of the different things that you're able to offer now? Sure. Uh, we have several different techniques of getting into the lymphatic system. Uh, sometimes we end up plugging up a leak from a lymphatic channel. Whether or not we plug up the entire thoracic duct or the main channel for the lymphatic system really depends on the anatomy and you know, where the leak is located. If it's a small branch, we're able to be more selective. We call that selective embolization. Uh, sometimes, if there's really not a great way to get in, we can just disrupt it with using a needle, um, or even our dye alone can actually treat a leak in some small children. 
there's the categories of treatments we can offer, including the dye, which is called lipiodol, or total selective embolization and disruption. I think, in, at least in previous years, there was a lot of concern about patients with shunts, and many of my patients have shunts, and there was this conception, and I guess it was true maybe in earlier years, that if you had a shunt, you weren't a candidate for uh, minimally invasive types of interventions. But I understand that's not true. Maybe you can kind of clarify that. Yeah, it's definitely been an evolution over the years. And while I will say if you have a right to left shunt, that definitely can make the workup and treatment just require a little bit more consideration. We certainly don't want the risk of stroke. We want it to be as small as possible. Some of the tricks we have are using that MR lymphangiogram to fuse to bony landmarks during our intervention in the procedure suite so that we don't have to use that oil-based dye. We also can do things like work backwards from the vein side, uh, going where we know we can get into it, uh, where it empties into the vein. That's called a retrograde technique. Mm -hmm. So by combining some of those methods, a lot of times we can get away with not using any lipiodol at all, which is really the main risk for stroke. Great. Um, I get a, a lot of families will be asking about, you know, what kind of risks the procedures involve. And of course, this will depend on individual patients and what you're planning and also kind of what to expect about getting back to getting out of the hospital, getting back to a normal diet, those types of things. Yeah, absolutely. It's such a, an uncertain time just waiting for sometimes a leak to dry up. Um, usually what I'll say is if we see a direct leak or, you know, something that we feel confident that this, you know, embolization or plugging up treated it, usually we can get back to their diet uh, within a week. Um, mm -hmm. If it's one of, you know, the the uh, pulmonary lymphatic perfusion system problems or uh, something that's more of a flow-related issue, then a lot of times we'll go a little slower to allow the body to create new pathways for that lymph flow. And sometimes that means maybe four weeks of being on a modified diet or just increasing it slowly. Great. Well, this is great technology, and I know you get a lot of consults from all over um, the nation. So how would a family or physician who's interested in potentially being evaluated, how would they contact our center? So lymphatics has really grown exponentially here at Mayo in the last decade. And a lot of that is just the added technology available mm -hmm. to us. We welcome any consults um, from anywhere. And if somebody wants to just shoot us an email at lymphatics at mayo.edu, we can get back to them as quickly as possible. Sometimes we might need some uh, outside records, you know, sure. to really give a good um, opinion, but um, we're happy to work with anybody. One of the things that comes to mind as I've seen this technology grow is um, the strengths of Mayo being, you know, technology and working between disciplines and things like that. And I think all that you, you and your colleagues have been able to do really highlight that. So thank you so much for your time and for serving our patients. Oh, thanks for having me.